Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about seven types and, well, we'll call seven types slash causes of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And if you don't already know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland. In fact, it's probably the most common cause in people, at least in the United States and developed countries, of hypothyroidism. And what this condition is, is it's basically an autoimmune disease, meaning your body is attacking and destroying your own thyroid gland. Now, obviously, this is not what you want to have, hap have happened in your body. And the reason we're discussing this is because there, there are triggers which cause this, this cycle to occur, where your immune system gets flared up and it starts attacking your thyroid. Now, we care about this because there are ways that if you can recognize that this is occurring, then you have the potential to stop it. Now, this is important because most doctors, they don't think about Hashimoto's in this way. In fact, they take what I call, and well, honestly, it's what they call, the wait and see approach. That is to say that they simply, if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as evidenced by elevated thyroid antibodies and damage to your thyroid gland, meaning you have symptoms of hypothyroidism, instead of doing anything to treat that immune dysfunction, these doctors will simply just wait. And they'll wait until eventually your thyroid becomes so damaged that you need to be on thyroid medication. And obviously, if you're a thyroid patient, that's not very appealing, right? You probably don't want that. You don't, you don't want to go about treating yourself in that way because you're really not doing any treatment at all. So it is really important to know if you have Hashimoto's or not. And um, you'll find that as we go through this, we're going to be talking about these causes. And what I want you to be thinking about as we go through these is which, you, which category or categories you fall into. Because if you understand these categories, you might be able to direct your treatment towards these things. All right, so let's go over these. So we have about seven, maybe eight here. Um, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about with the eighth. So number one is stress-related Hashimoto's. And I think this is probably the most common type of Hashimoto's that I see. Um, and unfortunately, it's probably also the most difficult to treat. Um, and, and what it is, is this. Most of, there's many situations where people will develop Hashimoto's after some sort of really big stressful event in their life. Now, in my experience, this tends to be something like a death of a loved one. It can be something like divorce or something like related to losing a job. It tends to be pretty serious. It doesn't always have to be that way. It can also be little sort of things. So, and I say little because everything's relative, right? But I have seen situations where people will go off to college and it's, you know, just really stressful their freshman year and things like that. So it can happen when you're young and when you're older, it doesn't really matter, but it's some sort of stress related event. Now, the problem with this cause of Hashimoto's is what we would like to do is treat the cause, right? In this case, it's stress. But once stress has occurred, you can't go back in time and fix that stress. So what you have to do is you have to find ways to manage your stress. And I have other videos that I talk about stress management, so I'm not going to get in those today, but that's your best bet. So you have to just teach your body to be more resilient to the stress that it's already been, that, it, that it's under. Because even if, number one, the stress already occurred, you can't go back in time and fix it. And number two, maybe it's something that you're going to have to live with for a period of time, or it's not going to go away. So these stress management tools are very important if you have stress-related Hashimoto's. And again, you'll know if you have this condition, because you'll notice that you are feeling fine, you know, well, rel relatively fine. And then once you have this stressful event, boom, all of a sudden you have Hashimoto. So it's, it's temporal in when you were developed your condition. Number two, infection-related Hashimoto's. So this is most commonly from um, viral infections. And the one that people know about a lot is the EBV virus or the Epstein-Barr virus. And EBV is a chronic virus. It gets into your body. It just stays there for a long time. Now, we don't necessarily care about um, that in particular. But what we do care about is that once you have the infection, it triggers something in your body and in your immune system that then causes the autoimmune disease. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is they'll think, well, if I can treat my EBV, then my Hashimoto's will get better. And that's true and it isn't. Okay, There are situations in which when you can treat EBV or you can treat this chronic sort of um, underlying infection, um, you can get some improvement in your Hashimoto's. And in fact, I do think that it is valuable to, to at least undergo treatments to try and do that, either naturally or with some, some medications. But I don't want you to think that if you do treat EBV, that it will necessarily take away your Hashimoto's because that isn't what always occurs. Um, now, there are other infections as well that can cause this. So if you have Hashimoto's, it doesn't guarantee that you've had EBV in the past. And in addition, if you looked at all the people who have had EBV virus, I think there was a study that came out and something like 70% of people when they got to um, retirement homes or you know these sort of old homes, they found that 70% of people that were living there had been exposed to that virus. So not obviously not all of these people have um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. They could have other conditions or they could be, you know, condition less and meaning that it didn't cause any issues. Um, so just having Hashimoto's doesn't guarantee that it was from EBV, EBV and just getting EBV doesn't guarantee that you will get Hashimoto's. And then of course there are other, other conditions and uh, bacteria that can cause it. So that was a virus we just talked about, but there are gut related infections um, as well that can trigger Hashimoto's. So it's not just isolated to EBV, just infections in general can flare up the immune system and cause it. 
And again, you tend to know this um, because first of all, when you get EBV, that, that causes mono. Um, and most people know when they're, you know, when they get hit by something like this, they feel pretty sick for a period of time. So it's, it's unlikely that this would have, would have occurred in the past and you wouldn't have really um, realized it. It can happen that way. And I have seen it a couple of times, but most people remember when they were really sick and then they just really didn't get better or they started to develop new symptoms over time. And so, like I said, most people, most people know, know when it occurs and it is temporal in the same sense that stress is. It occurs right around that event. Number three is gut related Hashimoto's. So I would say when you think about this, there are many of you listening who probably have gut conditions. I, I recognize that. I, I totally get it. But, but what I'm talking about here, when gut related um, Hashimoto's is, is the thing driving your Hashimoto's, it's because your gut is probably front and center in terms of your symptoms. So um, there are many of you who have things like constipation and maybe some overgrowth syndromes like small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or fungal overgrowth. And these might occur secondary to your thyroid condition, but they're not the primary issue. So you have to sort of tease that out. Now, most people who have their gut issue as their main issue, they know it. They have re really severe symptoms and they're very difficult to treat um, and they're really hard to, to get a handle on. So if you fit into that category, it's kind of hard to tease out. I understand that. But this is, these are the type of questions that I ask patients to try and figure out. Is their gut issue primary or is it secondary? And if it's secondary, then just fixing your thyroid will clean up your gut. And that's a great thing because it gets rid of it. Now, how does this cause Hashimoto's? Well, it causes it through something that we call molecular mimicry. So what happens is, and you probably understand leaky gut, but as you have inflammation and damage to the gut lining, um, there are barriers which prevent things from getting in. But as those barriers separate, or they become leaky, that's why we call it leaky gut, bigger particles can pass through and get into your blood. And then your immune system sees those things and they look similar to other parts of your body. So if there's something that comes in and it looks similar enough to the thyroid gland itself, your body will start um, attacking those foreign molecules and then your thyroid will just be a casualty. And then sometimes once it, once it gets started, it's really hard to stop. And so that's called molecular mimicry. And by the way, this is also why certain dietary changes are very impactful for people with Hashimoto's, removing gluten, dairy, soy, things like that, um, you know, removing any sort of processed food. These things happen to have a profound benefit for a lot of people on Hashimoto's because of their ability to heal back up that gut lining and just improve gut function in general. Okay, so that was number three. We're on number four now. Number four, I've included in here because I want you to understand um, it's a little bit different than the others. And I call it, end, well, it, it's not what I call it. It just is what it is. It's called end-stage Hashimoto's. And this is really when you have complete atrophy of the thyroid gland. And you can usually find this on ultrasound. Now, normally people who have this, these are people who have had Hashimoto's for decades, usually a very long time. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is because by the time you get to end-stage Hashimoto's, meaning you, your gland is basically shriveled up and is non-functional anymore. You're, it's sort of like you're sort of in the same category as those people who have had their thyroid completely removed surgically or damaged completely with radioactive iodine. So uh, all these other conditions, I'm telling you, there's, there's um, a lot of potential options for treatment and you want to start early so you can prevent the damage from occurring. But once you get to this damage, you sort of have to just focus on your thyroid because the damage has been done. And as far as we know, there's no way to regenerate your thyroid gland. So that, that's just really not an option at this point. Now you can stop it early. You can prevent further damage from it. But if you've had Hashimoto's for 30 years, sometimes the 25, 30 years or so, there's really not going to be much left after that time point, um, just due to the complete, you know, consistent damage from the, uh, the immune um, dysfunction in your body. Number five, um, I'm including this in here as well because um, it's important and I mentioned this before, but it's, it's mixed Hashimoto's is the, is the name of this one. And really what this is, is it's hard to determine one or more of these things. And I would say before, originally I said um, number one, which was stress-related Hashimoto's is probably one of the more difficult types of Hashimoto's to treat. Mixed Hashimoto's is as well. And I think probably this is more of just a wastebasket term to just say, well, if we're not really sure what is causing your Hashimoto's, we're going to throw you in here, which is probably why these people are also fairly hard to treat. And I, I have a feeling it's probably because we don't know exactly what's causing the or triggering the immune dysfunction in these people, um, but it is still a category and something you should be aware of. So I'll see a lot of people that have the stress-related Hashimoto's, but they also have gut issues. So we're, try, we're trying to figure out, well, is, was the gut primary or did the stress come first? And then that caused the thyroid dysfunction, with the, which then caused the gut issues. Really, sometimes it's kind of hard to tease out. So we put these people in mixed Hashimoto's. That's number five. Number six, we have environmental slash EDC slash chemical related Hashimoto's. Okay, so there's several different things that you can come into contact with. And these are chemicals that you can just find out and I'll, I'll explain where you find these things. And just coming into contact with these things can trigger the immune dysfunction and the autoimmune disease found in Hashimoto's. Okay, so I'm going to go over four of these and we'll talk about why these are really important. So number one, not in terms of importance, but just the number, the first thing I have on here 
is iodine consumption. And I don't want you to get freaked out by, by this term. I have other videos explaining it, but we do need to, we do need to talk about the fact that incredibly high doses of iodine, especially in the setting of low selenium and low zinc, they can trigger inflammation directly in the thyroid gland. And they have been associated with um, the development of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So you do need to be aware of that. That's why I never recommend ultra or mega high doses of iodine. I think the low to medium to high doses are fine, even in Hashimoto's, but mega doses are not. Um, so I have other videos on that, I'm not gonna go over it now, but you need to be aware of that. Now, the other things include polyaromatic hydrocarbons, okay, polybrominated biphenols, and polychlorinated biphenols. So these things are in various different things. So for instance, uh, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, they are produced from man-made combustion. The polybrominated biphenols, they come from plastics. Okay, so plastics that you can, you can drink out of or microwave things in plastics. That's why we tell you don't do those things because if they get into your body as they leach into your food, they, you will consume them and you will have to get rid of them. And then polychlorinated biphenols, which are flame retardants. They're found in a lot of different things, clothing and all sorts of things in, that, you, that, it's, uh, that are in your house. So you really want to avoid these as much as possible, especially if you have a genetic predisposition. We'll talk about number eight, which is a genetic component um, to developing Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So what do you do? I've already said before, you, you know, this is where the detoxification comes in. And this is why I will recommend detoxification um, techniques for a lot of people who have Hashimoto's, because even if it's kind of hard to know when you come into contact with these and how big of an impact they are playing in your body. So what I say is, look, just get rid of them anyway. So undergo the detoxification um, techniques to get out, get them out of your body. Soup up your liver function. Make sure that your AST and ALT are normal. By the way, I talked about that in my previous video, talking about how to look at your liver function. And this is why this is important. And this, when you look at everything, you want to be assessing for this type of stuff. I also have some supplements that help with detoxification. So you can take things like curcumin or fish oil, um, or I have a protein powder, which has a lot of these um, chemicals or not chemicals, but um, uh, components in it, which help your liver function and help with detoxification. So this is really important as well. And I would include number six. It's probably rare that I find somebody that has the environmental cause as their primary issue of Hashimoto's. I'm sure it's happening. It's just hard to, to identify. All right, number seven is, this is sort of, again, a little bit of a more broad term, and that's inflammatory slash pregnancy-related Hashimoto's. So you might be freaking out, like, why did I include pregnancy in here? And that is because pregnancy lowers your immune function slightly so that you're, so the mother doesn't attack the, the, the child that's inside of her. But in the process, you will find a lot of pregnant women end up with elevated thyroid antibodies. Now, some percentage of these women will also develop antibodies or continue to have antibodies through the lactation phase when they're breastfeeding. And then some of them will even develop furthermore Hashim full-blown Hashimoto's later on. So it's this this inflammation and this the pregnancy or the reduction in immune function which does trigger this. So you need to be aware of this. Doesn't mean you need to freak out and change anything, but what I recommend is get everything in order before you become pregnant. If you can do that before you become pregnant, then your reduction, you're reducing your risk of developing these issues down the line. But don't go into pregnancy, especially if you're you know, unhealthy or you have inflammation or you have Hashimoto's that isn't treated. That's just a recipe for disaster. It may get worse after pregnancy and so on. So take care of these things early. Number eight is a genetic component. So I've included this in here because the way that we like to think about Hashimoto's is that you have this genetic predisposition, or at least a lot of people do, and it's certain triggers then that when you come into contact with, then they trigger your Hashimoto's. So that could say, so let's put it this way. Let's say you have this genetic component, meaning you have family members who have Hashimoto's and you're just sort of going about your life and then sort of unluckily you get hit with EBV or the Epstein-Barr virus. Now, just the fact that you had the genetic component predisposition to begin with, then you got the infection, now you get Hashimoto's. So you're sort of, genetics play a role that we can't always control, but you can control the things you come into contact with to some degree, right? Like if you, you know, it's not always possible for you to prevent all infections, but you can do your best to, to avoid those chemicals that we talked about previously to reduce your stress and so on. So there are things that you can control as well. Now, just the genetic component isn't in itself uh, sufficient enough to, to make strong enough to cause Hashimoto's in all people because we have twin studies that show that only about 50% of twins um, get Hashimoto's. So it's not like it's 100% um, uh, penetrance in terms of that disease. So you, there are ways that you can modify your risk. But if you do have that genetic component, you're much, much more likely to develop it. Okay, so that was pretty much all I have for this um, for this topic today. So there's, a, I said there were seven, but there really is about eight. Um, and again, the, the reason we care about this stuff is because you need to know what's causing your Hashimoto so that you can treat it. 
Now you can treat it naturally if you catch it early. And my recommendation to you is to identify number one, if you have Hashimoto's and number two, start your treatment early. So you don't end up in end stage Hashimoto's because at that point it's very difficult to treat. If you catch it real early, there are things that you can do to prevent the damage from going on. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And otherwise I'll see you guys in the next one.